Okay, Scott, you know, re recently been named the Division II National Coordinator. I'm sure a lot of people in the Northeast don't know exactly who you are. I thought a good example of who you are was the story you shared last night with me about how your dad really got you started on this journey when you were 13 years old. Yeah, I was young uh, and didn't know any better and was broke and I wanted money. So my dad said, you want to make some money in the summertime, you, you should come umpire baseball with me. So I had played Little League up to 12 and I still played baseball, but I also got to go out and, and work Little League baseball 10 and under. Uh, when I was 13 years old and I think the thing about it was that it happened purely by accident probably because my dad was lazy and didn't want to work the plate and he could put me back there. Uh, I, I worked plate jobs from the time I was 13 all the way through my 16 year old year. For three straight years all I did was work nothing but plates. Um, then I went to pro school and got a job in pro school, but at school you, you, you found out that the Cadillacs are earned behind the plate and Chevys are earned on the bases. And when I heard that, I thought immediately of my dad. And so he, he probably did me a favor and got me into the game and uh, got me engaged at a young enough age that it was something that I really wanted to do and turned out okay for me. Absolutely. When you think now in terms of the foundational learning in terms of plate work that you were able to glean from just working constant plates, working twice a day on the plate. How much did that help you as you eventually excelled in pro ball and eventually in college ball as well? No, I, I don't know that you really ever get it completely right. We're always looking for that perfect plate job. Uh, there's only one game out of the thousands that I've worked that I can literally honestly look at you and say, I, I'm not sure I missed a pitch. There's always two or three. There's always four or five that they're gonna grab. I mean, look at Quest Tech scores in the big leagues and see what those guys score. I mean, you're seeing a lot of pitches, that means they're missing a few. And, and it's a perfectly, perfectly acceptable score. Uh, we're gonna make mistakes. You know, one of the things that, that, uh, that COG teaches that I love is when they put the colors on the corner, off the corners of the plate because it, makes guys understand and realize and track the ball all the way through and, and they don't really understand that they're not tracking the baseball the way they should. And uh, that was something that, that I, I've taken from Darren and the teaching that Darren and John are doing at, at COG and, I'm, and, and really taking it to another level. And I didn't go that deep when I was young. We probably didn't think about that when I was young, but at the same time, the perspective's still there. You know, pitch still has to be a strike, still gotta be there. Uh, you reward pitchers for being in the area, but not too far out of the area. So I think it comes with repetition. It's not necessarily the fact that you perfect your skills or make adjustments to your game. It's just more about seeing pitches. You know, one of the things we talked about yesterday was the fact that, you know, guys are complaining about guys who are working in the minor leagues coming back and taking their jobs and getting their games. Well, you know what? A guy who worked minor league baseball for five years has seen more pitches in five years than a college guy who knows nothing but college baseball seen in 20. So there's a big difference and there's something to be learned from those guys coming back from professional baseball and hopefully you can take that to your game at the college level and be able to improve. So it's, but for me it's all about getting back there and wanting to work. Best advice I can give to a young guy is when you're that guy who comes and works with two veterans, bring your plate gear. And, and be the guy that wants to work the plate. They may not let you because they may have the rotation already set for a purpose, but be the guy that's always ready to climb back there because you learn more from getting back there and doing that than you do watching somebody else do it. Now, I had never met you until this past summer and spent a few days in the clinic environment with you. And then subsequent to that, a few months later, I learned that you've been named the Division II National Coordinator. And my immediate thought was, Scott was born for that job. That said, what is your vision for the Division II program that you are now in charge of? I think one of the big things that's been missing in Division II is the fact that there was no uniformity with the others. Uh, Division I and Division Three were very much in line with what they were doing and trying to move up that process. And there was a big black hole, I think umpiring generally looked at Division II baseball as there was a black hole there. And, and what do you do once you get into that black hole? So what we've tried to do is throw some dirt in that hole and be able to get guys to understand that when you're coming through the system, the NCAA is providing an umpire development program 
just like professional baseball, minor leagues has a program that you go from rookie ball to short A to A to double A to triple A and you don't skip a step. Maybe not to the skip a step point in college baseball because I think a guy that goes to Appleton and works the Division Three World Series is ready for Division One baseball. So I think there's, there's two paths to take, either D2 or D3, and from there, progress and get into the next level. It's always got to be about the next level. You know, it, don't, be, don't be settling to be a guy who's a Division II career umpire. Go, go try to be a Division I umpire. And I think that my task is to be able to get a system put together in Division II to get guys advanced. Now, in your role, you're obviously going to be doing a lot of observing. You're going to be doing a lot of evaluating. So I think it'll be positive for the people listening to this interview. It's always good to know what somebody in your position is looking for. So what are the things that you value in an umpire in order for you to check off on them and have them advance to you know, a regional level or even further? Well, I don't watch base jobs. I can tell you that. I, I'm going out to look at a guy watch the plate. You know, I want him to, I want him back there in the action. I want to see how he reacts to a coach climbing on him on balls and strikes and does he shut the dugout down and, and do the right thing, but do it in the right way. That's even more important than handling your business, to handle the business correctly so that you don't adversely affect the game. Um, I, I, I really look at guys, the judging for me when an umpire walks on the field, I judge him from the very first step inside the gate. How do you carry yourself as you walk to home plate? Do you walk with a purpose? Do you go to home plate ready to do the job or do you kind of look around and check out the stands and stop by the coach's dugout and shake hands and hang out with the coach or the players for a couple minutes? Once you walk on the field, it, you should, it's kind of like that movie that uh, Kevin Costner is the pitcher and it's, it's, it's the trigger the mechanism. When you walk on a baseball field as an umpire, you should trigger the mechanism and you should go into a different mode. Not too far, but not too soft either. There's a good middle ground to find and I think guys find that along their way. But I think there's a, there's a certain way and decorum that we carry ourselves and it starts the minute you take that first step inside the gate to work. We had a conversation earlier today with another umpire that was here, and he said something that I thought was really interesting, and it certainly resonated with you. He essentially said, I might not be the best umpire, but I know I'm a damn good partner. What does that mean to you? George Drusus, the Division I national coordinator, says it best. We're not looking for the 96 best. We're looking for the best 96. And crew harmony means a lot. You could be the greatest umpire in the world, but you might get in the locker room and be a horrible crew guy. And that all goes into effect even at the Division II and the Division III levels. When we're putting you in a regional locker room with five, six, or seven other guys, are you going to get along? Or are you going to be the guy that's that thorn in everybody's side all weekend? It matters. Whether guys think it does or not, they just think it's about ball strike safe outs and how do I umpire? It's not. It quit being about that a long time ago. So it's not, it's just, it's just not about just what's on the field. You have gotta be a guy. I told the guy that said that earlier, I said, you know what? I would rather work with a second tier umpire who's a great guy that I wanna hang out with because honestly for me, the other 21 hours of the day that you're off the fields, every bit as important for me as the three that you're on. I want to work with good guys. I want to go, I don't want to look at the arbiter and I look at my game for that day and go, oh God, I got to work with him. Why do I, why do they assign me with this guy? I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that everybody goes, oh great, I got to work with Scott today. Or great, I got to work with Danny today. You know, be that, strive to be that person. That's, it's important whether you believe it or not. Now, you're new to this position, and you addressed it earlier about how things are you know, going to evolve and change. For the umpire out there that maybe hasn't been noticed, believes he should be noticed, believes a guy like you should at least have him on your radar, what would your message to that umpire that feels like he's been left behind before you ever took on this role? 
A mm. couple of things. Uh, one, I, wa I, I watch guys in meetings like this. We're here in, in Baltimore this weekend, and, and I watch guys come up and approach guys like myself and Don Umlin and Randy Bruns, and they, they want to get their face in front of you. They want to meet you, but it becomes something of, there's a fine line between networking and going too far. I got, most guys walk up to me and they want to get on my radar. Don't understand that you can't get you on my radar. Your coordinator's got to get you on my radar. Now, I say that, but the second part of that, part B becomes, be a guy that walks out on a baseball field that every time you walk on a baseball field, somebody's watching you. They may not be there watching you, but video's there and they're gonna find you some way or the other. So I might be at a ballpark in Boston and I have a guy on my watch list who I'm gonna take a look at and I'll go and I'll watch that guy work and I'll think, you know, he's okay. But all of a sudden out of nowhere, there's a guy working third base that day that's going out there just busting his hump and running hard and getting in position and doing the right things and, and making everything look good that I'm gonna call the coordinator who's assigning that game and go, okay, your guy was pretty good that you sent me to see, but tell me more about the guy that was working with him. I mean, that's how you can sneak on a radar without it maybe being your coordinator. Because if I'm seeing a guy and I see it with my eyes and I see that it, and I know what it is, although I can't explain what it is, but you see it, you know it, you can get on a radar pretty quick if you're a young guy that's working with a guy that I'm going to see and you show some signs of it and you make me watch you more than I'm watching the guy I'm there to see. A couple more. When I first met you was at that clinic in Indianapolis, like I mentioned earlier. And it's a shame I was not recording this, but one of the most fascinating things I saw that weekend was you and Darren Seeley discussing, discussing may not be the- We were probably fighting. About a simple mechanic. Both of you believed wholeheartedly that your way was the right way. And it's irrelevant who was right or wrong. It was just the passion that you two had for at least 35 minutes just about this mechanic. So with that as the foundation of my question, <laughs> where do you believe attending clinics and learning and improving in that fashion, where do clinics fit into the whole equation from your perspective? Big time, big time. It, it's, it's everything. I, I told the guys in the room, I said, when you quit learning, you begin to die. And if you're a guy who thinks you don't know, need to go to clinics because you know it all, your career is about to end, whether you believe it or not. It's gonna happen. You gotta learn and you gotta get better. You gotta get better every time out. And if you're not, I know, I know guys that have worked World Series that still go to clinics because they wanna get a different perspective on something. It, it really, Danny's everything for me. If you're a guy that wants to learn, then I'm a guy that wants to work with you and, and try to make you a little bit better. Perfect example. I'm teaching at a clinic in Michigan a couple of years ago, and Mike Duffy, who was a College World Series umpire in Omaha, uh, who's a great umpire and worked 20 some years to finally achieve the goal, pulls me aside during this clinic and he says, can we go out early in the morning and get in the cage because I want you to see my stance. I'm, I'm a scissors guy and I'm wanting to go to the box. And for me to do that, and I've watched you teach the box, I need, I need to get your thought and your perspective on how I should be approaching it. There's a guy that's been to Omaha that still wants to learn. Now, he didn't go to a clinic. He was, he was instructing in a clinic, but he wanted to learn so badly that he made me come out two hours early before a clinic started at nine o'clock in the morning. We go out at 7 a.m. so that he can see pitches and make some adjustments where should my feet be? Where should my head height be? Because it's completely different working the box versus working the scissors. And he doesn't miss pitches. Trust me, he's in the scissors. He looks great, he doesn't miss pitches, Danny, but he was afraid that his back was gonna start getting sore the older he, and the closer he gets to be 60, he wanted to relieve some of that pressure. So he felt like he needed to make a change. Good for him for doing it. 
And we'll see because this year he's going to try it. So I'm, I'm eager to see Mike do that and see what happens. So clinics are everything. Learning is everything. you got to continue to learn. You get, if you don't learn, you don't get better. One final question. And I know you're off the field now, but you've spent a long time on the field working high-level baseball. Why did you umpire? Mm. That, the, the answer to that question was evolution, actually. It evolved into many different things. Looking back on my career, when I very first started umpiring at 13, this is about to cash. <laughs> 13 years old, and I'm out there making $10 a game, you know, and I'm thinking, that's great. That was like, what, 1972, 73 when I started? Uh, so $10 a game was a lot of money back then. Uh, then it became later on about trying to advance and climb the ladder. Once I advanced and climbed the ladder a little bit, and I, I was about to graduate from college, and right before I did, semester before, I said, if I don't go to umpire school now, I'm going to settle in, I'm going to go find a job, and I will never try, and I will always wonder what if. So I went to umpire school, and I went to California, and I had never been to a state that did not touch Oklahoma, and I'm 21 years old, and go to California, the Bill Kinneman School. That tells you how old I am. Bill Kinneman, not Brinkman, not Evans, not it was Bill Kinneman, 1982, and was fortunate enough to be well thought of, although I was overweight and fat, and they told me I needed to lose weight at the time. Uh, but I did before I went to the advanced school. And it, so it became now about the necessity of, okay, let's do this for a career and see what happens. Then I quit after my double A year in, in 85. And after that, I kind of went, okay, I'm not gonna work anymore. I'm not gonna umpire anymore. I took a couple of years off and found that I missed it a little bit had the opportunity and now come back full circle and now I go back and do in college baseball because I wanted to make a little extra money. I wanted to make some more money, I wanted to go do it. And then I went through a burnout. 95 I came off the field and was off the field for 11 years. Got completely away from the game of baseball. Got fat, real fat, like almost 300 pounds fat. And I knew that at that point in time I needed to get back into baseball because it was the only way that I knew to get back in shape and try to get healthy again because I was awful. I, we're talking job of the hut ugly. I was bad. And so I did. I got back on the field, dropped some weight really quickly, and, and got, felt better and got better back into shape. And then it was about chasing a ring, getting a ring. And then it was about going back and showing that I could still do it at the Division I level. And then coming off the field and transitioning off the field after the 2014 season, I started thinking more and more about getting my start at the time I was 55. I'd done a lot and I was never going to go back into the Division I mix of postseason. And I, it was for me about where was I going to leave my legacy. So I took a Division II coordinator's job at the conference level. Rich Fetchett gave me the opportunity to do that and said you could still work Division I baseball and do this job. Well this conference is 16 schools big stretches from Kansas City to Indianapolis, from Wisconsin down to Southern Missouri and into Kentucky. Big conference, and if you're gonna do the job right, you gotta go out and give the guys feedback and watch them work. And I could not do that and continue to work baseball. So I, at that point in time, I decided to step off the field. And now getting the national coordinator's job, which was really not something I was looking to do, the position came open and they said, are you interested? And then we, my wife and I got to talking about it a little bit, and so I'm leaving a footprint legacy in a conference. I get to leave a really large footprint legacy in a national spectrum. And I felt like it would be an honor to my dad who got me started. So that's why.